humans. Ask the Japanese. Japanese, the Dutch, Hong Kong. When we talk about poverty, crowdedness, the whole, the whole counterculture vision that if you're overcrowded, it's terrible, go look at Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is one of the most dynamic, active centers of productivity on the planet. Look at Singapore. Depends on what you do with the human beings. If you arouse the human beings, if you create the opportunities, and he quotes a, a law which is almost never quoted by modern economists. Uh, Say's law, uh, Jean-Baptiste Say, basically argues that supply creates demand. See, no, no modern bureaucrat can, can understand this. Say's law is, it's S-A-Y, just like it sounds, that supply creates demand. Now, a modern economist, because all modern government economists start, and in all, in all, all, virtually all bureaucrats and academics, start with the idea of continuities. So if you're going to measure demand, the demand is for postal service. Then you say, somebody invented the fax. But there was no demand for the fax. Because nobody knew it existed. The second they learned it existed, guess what? There is huge demand for the fax. Huh? Now it's email. Cellular telephones. There were no cellular telephones. People had very expensive radio telephones, which only very, very wealthy people or government institutions could afford. And then one morning, somebody invented the cellular phone. How many of you have a cellular phone? Look at this. I mean, what a, what a, now, granted, you're an upper middle class group of people, and you're all sort of semi-wealthy, uh, at, at least by the standards of Bangladesh. Uh, but, but, you know, you look around there, 20, I think, I think the number now is 25 million people use cellular phones. 10% of the country has a cellular phone. It'll probably be 40% by the end of the decade. And it's routine, right? I mean, there's now billboards telling you how to order your Domino's or your Pizza Hut on the way home so it'll be there by the time you are. And just think about that concept. I mean, home delivery pizza was an invention which promptly found a demand. It's very important. If the concept is, that, and this is why all modern liberal economics is essentially wrong. I mean, if, they are, if the concept is supply precedes demand, then what you want to do is maximize the number of inventors. If the idea is that demand is a limited thing, what you want to do is what the Federal Reserve does, which is control demand. But in fact, if you are an entrepreneurial, science, spirit of invention and discovery oriented society, you never worry about it because you figure out people will come along and invent the next phase of winning. Microwave ovens, which are now invaluable. Could it also though, be argued that uh, there was already a demand for communication? There was already demand. Sure. There's a, there's a demand for eating. But that doesn't mean you can say that, therefore, we'll have a microwave. Well, well I understand yeah. that as far no, as the supply. Course. Of you course. Of course. I mean, if you were to produce a supply of something humans had no use of, it would sit in a warehouse. So obviously, lots of things are invented that don't create demand. But there's a very important question, which comes first? And you'll find that in all the big breakthroughs, it is the supply which precedes the demand. So it's not just you study the market. You have a vision of the future. You have a vision of what humans like. You have a vision of what they need. Now, let me, let me give you an example out of the counterculture of how different that is. I, I think of it as, as uh, uh, imagine that Thomas Edison invented the electric light today in the age of the counterculture. I think it would be reported on the evening news in a story which began, the candle making industry was threatened today. <laughs> okay? Or, or imagine the Wright brothers going into EPA and OSHA to get permission to try to fly at Kitty Hawk. Have you ever thought about what it would have been like? You know, get, having to do the surveys, having to, you know, how unlikely it would be that they'd ever get around to doing it? What I'm trying to suggest to you here is that invention and discovery are a matter of mind, that they are a way of life, that in fact people, you have to think about the eccentricity, the energy, the spirit, the attitude that lead to this. One of the really superb works on this is Peter Collier and David Horowitz, their biography of the Fords. This is, this is quite a remarkable book and I want to share with you a couple of, of uh, quick examples from, from the history of Henry Ford. This is the prologue, Detroit, June 4th, 1896. It was after midnight when a light summer mist started to fall outside the backyard workshop and Henry Ford began putting the final touches on the peculiar looking machine which had obsessed him in one form or another all his adult life. Now remember, this is June 4th, 1896. 
On most other evenings, Felix Julian, the old man who lived in the flat next door to the Fords and had cleared out half, his half of the shed to give the machine more space to grow, would have been there too, sitting in a corner of the shed, watching the painstaking assembly in silent awe. In fact, Ford had often arrived home from his daytime job. Compare that to the modern way, world. He worked all day. His daytime job as chief mechanic at Detroit's Edison Illuminating Company to find Julian sitting alone in the shadows, star staring at the odd contraption slowly taking shape, impatient for him to hurry through dinner and get to work. But now on this night of nights, the old man had unaccountably decided to go to bed early, and so he missed the last act of the great drama. It was almost 2 a.m. when Henry and his friend Jim Bishop finished work. Although he was haggard from having gone two nights without sleep, Ford's recessed gray eyes flashed with excitement. His invention was finally ready for a test. But as he began to maneuver it toward the door, there was a revolution of the revelation of the myopia everyone who knew him accepted as a paradoxical part of his visionary nature. The machine was too big to fit through the doors of the shop. <laughs> How would you like to have the modern media covering live the self-proclaimed genius's failure to measure his car? <laughs> Can you imagine the ridicule he would have faced? And notice again, he didn't apply for a government grant. He didn't say, I can't invent unless you subsidize me. He worked all day to go home and work all night. Without hesitating, Ford seized them all and began to knock out an opening in the brick walls. Henry rolled the vehicle he later referred to as the baby carriage, a light chassis and four bicycle wheels, out into the night. The metaphor came naturally. It was as if the womb of his creativity, gravid since boyhood, was finally opening. Ford would tell what happened next thousands of times in the coming years, never tiring of the repetition, always speaking in the tones of wonderment most men use to describe the birth of their firstborn. As it became worn smooth with frequent retelling, the story eventually came to have the understated simplicity of a creation myth. Quote, it was raining. Mrs. Ford threw a cloak over her shoulders and came outside. Mr. Bishop had his bicycle ready to ride ahead and warn drivers of horse-drawn vehicles, if indeed there were anywhere to be met at such an hour. I set the choke and spun the flywheel. As the motor roared and sputtered to life, I climbed aboard and started off. The car bumped along the cobblestones of the alley as Mr. Bishop rode ahead on the bicycle to warn any horse-drawn vehicles. We went down Grand River Avenue to Washington Boulevard. Then the car stopped. Again, imagine the modern media. We discovered that one of the ignition igniters had failed. When we had it repaired, we started the car again and drove back home. Both Mr. Bishop and I went off to bed for a few winks of sleep. Then Mrs. Ford served us breakfast and off we went to work as usual. This is the beginning of the second largest industrial company in the world. In his backyard, in a garage, in his spare time after he works all day. He goes on to say, by the way, the rest of the week, Ford drove all through Detroit. Jim Bishop bicycled ahead of him as a flagman, stopping at saloons and stores to tell people to come out and hold their horses. One day, the little vehicle knocked a man down. By the time Ford had turned off the engine and climbed down, the victim lay on the ground, caught between the front and rear wheels. Ford leaned over and discussed the problem with him. Should he, <laughs> should he start the engine again and finish driving over him, or should he try to move the car? Finally, another man appeared and helped Ford pick up the quadricycle and move it off the prostrate man, who stood up, dusted himself off, accepted Ford's apologies, and walked off, victim of the first recorded auto accident. <laughs> Too bad the was That's right. That's right. Just when you need a good trial lawyer, where are they, right? <laughs>